Okay, so a year ago in Warsaw, we talked about the journey that we'd made since Rio when we said, look, we've really got to just all come together from across the agriculture community, across the forest community into one, as Andrew said. And here you are all again, and there's more of you, I think, and there's a long list of people who couldn't even get into the hotel. And this is a very long journey. It's been a long journey to get here. It's going to be a long journey going forward. And it's very important that when you get to the top of one hill, you stop and you look back and you see where you came from. And you stop and you look forward and you see where you're going. So today is about implementation, as Andrew said, but it's also about realizing what it took to get here, learning the lessons of success and failure, and redoubling our commitment to go further, faster. Since we met a year ago, lots of things have happened. Lots of good things have happened, some maybe not so good, but all lessons worth learning. I think the most important thing is that the IPCC report that came out in early November really helped us in terms of making the argument about why we have to take a landscapes approach and why this has to rise up the list of priorities even further by basically taking away all grounds for argument that the goal is anything other than to decarbonize our economy by 2100. It places firmly in the center of our activity, our action, our need for action, our ability to manage our landscapes in a fundamentally different way than we have often been able to up to now. We will engineer a clean energy revolution in the next few decades. We will engineer a revolution in the way in which urban transport systems work. We will engineer these revolutions. But even if we are immensely successful in so doing, we will have to fundamentally manage our landscapes differently to provide the nutrition for the people who will live on this planet, to provide the livelihoods and the sustenance to those people who live in the rural areas to provide ourselves with the diversity of nature that we need to survive, to provide ourselves with the ability to reduce emissions from our forests and our agricultural methods, to provide jobs and competitiveness to economies that must survive. We will need to do all of that. And without landscapes, we're just not going to achieve what the IPCC has said quite clearly now must be the goal. So I think that technically, yes, we, uh, we maybe have lots of things that we need to share, but I don't think yet that we have fully yet made the, made the case successfully to those people outside of this room that this is economically and financially possible. We've been saying for a year now that we believe that the science is clear, that the economics are compelling, and the politics remain challenging. I think the science is now crystal clear. I think the economics are compelling. There's been report after report after report. But exactly what you do with that compelling economics and how you integrate this into your vision of your country's future is exactly what's at stake here at COP20 and between this meeting and Paris. The way in which the nationally defined contributions take a comprehensive approach to our responsibility to effectively manage our economies will really be the test of whether they succeed or not. This is about really understanding the options available to each country across, comprehensively across their economy. And obviously for, for agriculture-based economies and for forest-based economies, these INDCs will have to be able to show the road forward based on your work, based on the examples that you can give. We take very seriously our responsibility as the World Bank Group to be a long-term partner of choice as countries develop their nationally defined contributions, as countries begin to think through the at scale and the speeded up action that is needed. And in fact, this provokes in us a need for more reflection on how we work. You will hear later in the Forest Forum from my colleague Paolo Caballero about the way in which we think about the SDGs related to the climate challenge. One of the things, and she will lead our effort around reframing our forest work, 
But one of the things that we know we need to do is to take the extraordinary financial resources which have been so generously provided by just a few countries for taking Red Plus to scale and packaging that in such a way that countries can access it in a much more user-friendly way than has been the case to pass. So, we have, uh, between the Forest uh, Carbon Partnership Fund, between the Biocarbon Fund, more than a billion dollars worth of investable resources and a long list of countries that are ready to access that money. And that has to be packaged in a phased approach which will really allow us to show how this work can happen at scale and how it can work in the context of an integrated landscape approach. We take that responsibility very clearly. We intend to program that money much quicker than we have done up to now. And we will, of course, continue to work with all of you to do that. We would encourage those who've been so generous in their ability to finance the piloting of different approaches on how we can finance this implementation to continue to do so. They're extremely grateful to those who put additional money last week into the climate investment funds another $600 million coming in both to the, forest, uh, the FIP and into the uh, SRAP. Uh, another $600 million for implementation right now. Uh, there's nothing that needs to uh, be done in setting anything up for that to go. So that means we will be allowed to work in another seven countries. And in fact, we're $800 million short of being able to fund the entire pipeline that we sit on. Complemented by the contributors' decision to keep the climate investment funds going for another couple of years while other funds are establishing themselves, we have the mechanisms to scale now. And I think this is very important. So the other thing that's happened since we last saw you, and this will be my last point, is how you understand value and how you understand the integration of a landscape approach into an economic, uh, the responsibility to manage our economies differently, and what that means to a development institution in a year where development will be discussed alongside climate action. In the last year, we've put climate and disaster risk screening on all of our lending to the poorest countries. In the last year, we've introduced our own internal price on carbon. In the last year, we've agreed how to set discount rates for intergenerational equity for every loan that we make. In the last year, we have agreed the extension and rollout of greenhouse gas accounting for all of our lending. And there's more for us to do. But we need every development financial institution, bilateral and multilateral, to join us if we are going to be able to direct long-term financing into the things that we value most. And those are the things that we find in an integrated landscape. We're not there. I'm not here to say that we've figured everything out. But there, there is a fundamental shift in multilateralism and multilateral aid and development at stake. If indeed the challenge is to decarbonize the global economy by 2100 and at the same time to protect natural resources, at the same time to provide jobs and growth and opportunity and prosperity to those people who have the right to believe that they can achieve it, then that's a very different challenge than the challenge that we or the United Nations was created for 70 years ago. We were created for a world of post-war reconstruction and development. Now, what we have to do is work hand in hand with all of you and each of our shareholders and member states to continue to construct and to continue to develop and to decarbonize at the same time. It's a fundamentally different challenge. Many of the tools and many of the answers are in this room and we will be your partner on this journey. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Rachel. Um, and the next in line, and I think we're now gonna speak from the sitting down position.